I think, Jeff, would you like to do the introductions? I, I'm, I'm happy to, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, Managing Editor of American Purpose. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. I appreciate greatly all of you making time today. One hour conversation, hard stop, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's a season of elections, as you know. Hungary, Serbia, France, upcoming, all important. It's a pleasure to have today with us Patrick Shamarel, who is a senior scholar lecturer at Stanford University. He is a member of the American Purpose Editorial Board, and he is a friend of Jeff Gedman. And Patrick has a, a, a terrific presentation prepared. He also has an article. I think we have an advanced copy ready for you today, but in any case, the final article to be published on Thursday in advance of Sunday's election. Patrick, welcome. The floor is yours. We look forward to hearing from you. And then at the conclusion of your presentation, having a good discussion round with Q&A. Patrick. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm very pleased to be here. And I can see many friends uh, in, the, in the windows. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to speak uh, no longer than 20 minutes so that, so that to leave as much time as possible for, for the Q&A. Um, this is, uh, so I don't think you should worry, it's a PowerPoint, but uh, I, I hope, I, I don't think it's going to be as boring as you, as you think it will be. So, so this is the, this is, these are the last, uh, the, the, the eight presidents of the Fifth Republic Macron being the, the eighth, uh, we are in the 11th presidential election. As you see, uh, presidents have all been either on the right or the left. Macron is the first one to be in the center. So you had uh, two on the left, uh, five uh, on the right, and Macron, the only one on the center. If he gets reelected as is predicted, it would be the, the first one to be reelected outside of cohabitation, meaning that uh, the majority in parliament right now is, is held uh, by his own party. And it's more difficult, you know, arguably uh, to, uh, uh, well, at least it was easier for, Mitt for Mitterrand and Chirac to be able to campaign against uh, the majority uh, which was an incumbent majority in the opposition. So, so what it means for, for Macron should not be uh, underestimated. So as you know, um, the system has changed somewhat uh, at the beginning of the 2000s uh, in two ways. First of all, the presidential terms was reduced from seven to five years. Uh, so Chirac is the one who had his first term seven years, the, the, the second one five years. And also uh, since then, um, the legislative elections uh, take place, have taken place immediately after the presidential one to uh, you know, make sure, or at least to try to uh, make uh, the majority uh, on the side of the president because of the, of the momentum that the uh, presidential election represents. Um, so we will have in June, uh, such a legislative election. And uh, so what I'm going to show you a few, a few slides, but the main point of these slides is that despite the fact that this election looks like a con uh, an election of continuity, and it will be if of course Macron is reelected, um, exactly the opposite of uh, the election of, of five years ago, which was an election of change. Uh, it doesn't, it should not be interpreted as, as uh, the country endorsing the status quo. Macron uh, has not be a miracle president. Uh, he has not to solve all of France's problem. He has not uh, even uh, implemented all of his promises. But if his victory would rest on two 
things. First of all, the fact that uh, um, we are in a special context with COVID, the campaigns you know, took place at the kind of end of, of COVID, hopefully the end of COVID, um, although there's a, some re reservance now, we, we can talk about it. And, uh, and of course, uh, during Ukraine. And uh, that has been a very big advantage, of course, for, for, for Macron, who is the sitting president. He's got much more uh, visibility and is very credible on, on, on the issues, uh, especially international issues. The second reason why Macron is, is likely to win, and, and we'll see you know, by a large margin, is uh, that the opposition is still divided. And this is a legacy of the 2017 election. So it's impossible, I think, to understand this election properly unless we go back, which we will do now briefly, to 2017, what happened then. So this is the National Assembly as, as it was elected just after the last presidential elections in 2017. You see that Macron's party is, uh, as of course, a, a wide majority, uh, which is no longer the case because 40 deputies left during his presidency, mostly deputies from the left. Uh, but, and, and the Socialist Party has kept only one tenth of its votes. You know, it lost 90% of its vote and the center right party, the LR, Les Républicains, lost almost, uh, no, actually more than half of its, of its uh, deputies. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Macron's majority occupies the strategic center. That just means that his opposition is split on both sides. And this is a, a key asset, of course, for Macron. And as we will see, you know, it's not only split on both sides, but each side is, is very, very divided. So, so this was the first round uh, of, you know, that presidential elections take place in two rounds, you know, unless you get 50% of the votes in the first round, uh, there, there is a, a runoff between the two top vote getters. Um, it never happened that, of course, any president, even the goal was elected with 50% in the first round. So you see that, you know, uh, the socialist um, presidency of, of Francois Hollande was, was kind of a disaster. And um, even before he decided not to seek re-election, he only was credited with 9% of the votes. Actually, then there was a primary among his party and the winner of the primary did only 6%. And we will see that today in this current election, the socialist candidate is, is expected to do 2%. So the socialist party died more or less uh, five years ago and never recovered. Um, so Fillon was going to, you know, in a normal alternation, Fillon is on the center right, Les Républicains, to win easily. Of course, we know now that it didn't happen because of a scandal that uh, hit him after uh, he was uh, chosen in the primaries. So he lost uh, he, about 10 points and he didn't make the runoff. And, uh, and Macron rose from 14 points that you saw on the previous slide to 23. So he, he basically uh, made up uh, you know, the gap. And uh, Mélenchon on the left was by far the, the leading uh, left candidate and he's on the left of the Socialist Party. So it benefited also you know, the uh, far left compared with, with the left. So for the, again, for the first time, neither the socialists or the neo gaullists are in the runoff. And, uh, and uh, the two candidates that were in the runoff, um, neither of them believes actually in the right versus left dichotomy that has structured French politics since the revolution. Um, so one is, for the, for, for the first time, is in the center, bridging the center right and the center left and the other one on, on the far right. And as you see, it was, a, as George W. Bush said, a drubbing you know, uh, kind of election, a very, very uh, massive victory for, for um, Macron. Because again, in, in the two round elections, you have to have allies in, your, in the runoff and Marine Le Pen never managed to have allies in the runoff. So, of course, Macron promised lots of uh, uh, renewal in French politics, but 
basically what, what happened with uh, that election is that uh, the electorate structure itself more by kind of class, you know, level of education, social economic status, etc., than uh, ever before. And, uh, and you see that uh, Macron has a very, very narrow uh, base, political base, which is mostly among the urban, uh, well-educated, uh, affluent uh, folks. And Marine Le Pen, exactly the opposite with a very, very strong working class uh, base. So, so now what happened during, I mean, uh, what happened during the Macron's presidency? Uh, well, again, he, he didn't solve all the problems what president does, but, and, and, but what he did very well is that he overcame three major crises. Uh, the yellow vest crisis, which was a revolt uh, against uh, the elites and against uh, you know, liberal economic policies. And that lasted more than a year with uh, sometimes violent demonstrations in, in, in big cities. Uh, then you had COVID and then of course, Ukraine, the last two you know, interfering with the current campaign. So, um, so now you see that this is the question is Mac, has Macron been a good president? And you see that majority of, of the French say no, 60%. And that opposition of course comes from the fringes from the far left and the far right, but it comes and, and the, but the socialist party or what's left of it as well as the center right, they are really split between people who tend to be pro Macron and people who, who tend to you know, be in the opposition to Macron. See, it's about 50-50 in the Socialist Party, but more importantly in, the, in LA on the center right. And uh, mostly the left uh, has considered Macron to be, quote, the president of the rich, meaning that his liberal economic policy, especially the dilution of the wealth tax is something that uh, they, they never forgive uh, him. And on the right, uh, the main themes have been immigration, law and order, and uh, which uh, folks on the right believes uh, Macron has been too soft on, on those issues and even ignoring them sometimes or neglecting them. So this is the uh, approval ratings of, of Macron during his, uh, his presidency. And you see that the liberal economic reforms came first and uh, he, he lost support then, and then came the uh, the yellow vest or revolt. And right after he touched button, you know, like a couple of months after the beginning of the revolt, revolt, but then he started coming back because again, he handled that very well. You know, he tried to uh, paint uh, these folks as, uh, you know, violent extremists and, uh, and reassure people, I'm going to protect you against this, that the, the, the civil disorder. And, uh, and also he reached out to, uh, uh, people in the, uh, in the, uh, you know, and, and the grassroots with many, many meetings uh, 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 throughout the country and people uh, lack that sense of dialogue that he showed. Um, so, so this is, so yeah, it, so through COVID and through Ukraine, you see that his, his uh, approval ratings uh, came back. Now, this is the, the presidential candidates. They were more, but you have to gather 500 signatures from local officials to qualify to run. And it has been somewhat controversial this year because of course, candidates who, who, have a, who can benefit from a, a strong party infrastructure at the local level benefit. And people like uh, Zemmour uh, to your right, uh, of course, had absolutely no, uh, no local uh, basis like Macron did not uh, five years ago. So you see that, so there are 12 candidates that were 11 five years ago, so it's about the same. You see on the, on the left, that's of course a, you know, a, a French specialty, you have like four uh, who are on the far left. I, I mean like a, a communist, you, know, you don't find that very, uh, in, many, in many countries, uh, two to the left of the communist, you know, Trotsky candidates, then Mélenchon, which is the main one in, 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 the, in, the, in the far left. 
and actually on, on the left all together. Uh, and then you see that this is the socialist candidate. She's the mayor of Paris, but she's to, she's uh, expected to, to do like something like 2%. And this is the green candidate. And the green has, have been somewhat disappointing. You know, they were supposed to, you know, party to be a party of a, you know, growing party. And, and they, are, they are about 5% and they are very, very divided. They have always been very divided. That, then you see two centrists, but of course the main one is Macron. Uh, and then you see on, on your right, uh, four candidates uh, on, on the right and far, and far right. So Pécresse is from Les Républicains. And you remember that uh, Fillon from Les Républicains before the scandal was at like around 30%. Then he came to 19% uh, in the first round. And Pécresse now is around 10%. So you see that maybe, you know, uh, after finishing off the Socialist Party five years ago, Macron will finish off the center right uh, party. And to the right, you see Marine Le Pen, of course, uh, but also Eric Zemmour. And so one of the key um, innovation of this, uh, of this campaign is that the far right now is split between two candidates and you know, possibly two parties uh, in the future. And, uh, and I will explain uh, later uh, what the difference between those, those two varieties of the far right are. Um, so these have, have been the polls for the first round of election, you know, so far. And what you can see is Macron has always been very, very much higher than anybody else and fairly stable. And we will explain this bump, you know, recent bump by, by the Ukraine uh, war. Uh, then there was a very tough uh, competition between Marine Le Pen and the two new candidates, Valérie Pécresse, uh, the center right, and Éric Zemmour, the, who has been the, you know, really the disruptor of this campaign, uh, like Macron was uh, five years ago, if you want. But, uh, uh, and then Mélenchon, who is the far uh, left candidate. So you see these, the three right candidates were really, really very close all along, except that they that Marine Le Pen in the last few weeks really edged out you know, the other candidates. And Jean-Luc Mélenchon also you know, passed uh, Eric Zemmour and Valérie Pécresse. Uh, so they are now around, as you can see, you know, like 10% for Valérie Pécresse and Eric Zemmour, Mélenchon around 14% and Marine Le Pen around 20%, and, and not to mention Macron around 30%. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, the, you know, what Ukraine, how Ukraine impacted the race. You see that Macron jumped, you know, between four and 8.5%. So it's probably the highest he scored in the polls at 33.5. Uh, and um, Pécresse and Zemmour, uh, you know, came down. Pécresse, because she's uh, so close to Zemmour, you know, as a candidate, uh, as a personality, and even politically, that everything that benefits Zemmour usually, you know, has, has hurt uh, Pécresse, um, uh, Macron rather, has hurt Pécresse. Zemmour, of course, is, you know, key issues of immigration, crime, etc., have been over, overwhelmed by, by Ukraine, so that's not a, a good thing for him. And, but you would think that, you know, Be uh, Le Pen, Mélenchon, and Zemmour, they all had sympathies, had expressed sympathies for, uh, Putin in the past, and they are critics of uh, the EU as well as, as NATO, you would think that they would be hurt by, by uh, Ukraine. And only Zemmour uh, has been hurt. He, he, hurt. he said that uh, he was not so sure that he would welcome uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees, for example. Um, but Mélenchon, you know, I think he benefited from uh, last minute um, regrouping on the left, you know, to, to, to uh, qualify for the runoff. But Marine Le Pen, yes, that's interesting. The reason why she benefited from Ukraine is that her major issue is purchasing power. You know, immigration, et cetera, is now considered, you know, the major issue of Zemmour, but Marine Le Pen has really uh, campaigned on uh, economic uh, issues. And uh, since, uh, you know, the price of gas and food has, has gone up, you know, with the Ukraine crisis, uh, it, it kind of, you know, mesh with, with, with her, uh, 
uh, favorite issues, and that's what, how, how she benefited from it. So Ukraine, of course, most people say they are worried by it. Uh, they worried, or rather worried. That's not a surprise. Um, but as you see here, this, these are all of the key uh, campaign issues uh, for uh, people. Your Ukraine is there, uh, but it's only 15% um, of people who say that uh, it would matter in their vote. Uh, place of France in the world, 5%. You know, Macron is the, of course, he's the president, uh, rotating president of the EU. So that gave him even more visibility in the last uh, few, uh, couple of months. And, but you see that, you know, economic issues, health because of COVID, security in, in, in French says security, but in, in English, it's really crime. Uh, and all of these issues are, are the, main, the main issues. Um, So now we have the, the polls for the second round, which is absolutely decisive, of course. And you see Macron versus you know, potential uh, challengers. Um, so Macron versus, uh, uh, you know, he, he wins against all of them. You see that Pécresse was the most likely uh, to uh, challenge him in the runoff because she's just to the right of Macron and uh, really in the center of gravity of French politics right now. Uh, but of course, we have to, to qualify to get in the runoff. Uh, so, so she didn't do very well to, in, the, in the first round, <clears throat> both because I think she's too close to, to Macron again. She's pulled between the right of her party, which is tempted by Zemmour, uh, you know, which is conservative on, on immigration, for example, and the, and the center of her party, which is you know, very much uh, like uh, like uh, Macron on economics, on economic policy, and, and then she 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 has really shortcomings as, as a candidate. You know, she's not very charismatic. She's a very bad public speaker, for example. Uh, Mélenchon, uh, you see, it's a big gap. Uh, Mélenchon uh, again has come uh, up recently. Uh, Le Pen, but Le Pen is is what's you know likely to happen. So. Uh, and, but you see that the margin is the smallest among all of these duels. You know, the, the smallest is the most likely uh, to, ha to happen. And Le Pen has come back up, you know, recently again, you know, Ukraine factor. And uh, she has, a, uh, she's, she's been very resilient. Uh, these two actually uh, have almost died politically <laughs> a few years ago. Um, Le Pen, uh, after a uh, severe defeat uh, five years ago, and the TV debate that preceded that runoff, which was a disaster for her, but she recovered. Um, <clears throat> and Macron, of course, he was almost uh, believed to to be on the on the on the verge of resigning uh, a, a, at the worst of the uh, Yellow Vest uh, movement. So this is. Uh, I'm going to give you time to, to look at this. Uh, this is how important, you know, in, in, in a two round election, it is key to understand how the votes of the first round can be redistributed in the second round. Because again, you need, you need allies uh, uh, in the second round. You cannot just rely on, on, on voters on your base. So you see that, uh, of course, uh, you know, there's a big uh, abstention, you know, in general, and this is one of the, uh, you know, concern for this election is, is the high level of, uh, of abstention, first of all, because Macron is, is supposed to win anyway, so people are not mobilized to go vote for Macron, and then Le Pen is, um, because of her constituency, which is mostly, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, the less educated and the less affluent people, you know, they, they tend to be, to be, you know, to, to abstain uh, proportionally more. So uh, what's interesting here is that most of Zemmour's voters are expected to vote for Le Pen. Not a big surprise, but, but it's still, uh, you know, like 70%. This is a lot of, uh, a lot of votes. Um, then, of course, uh, Pécresse votes will go mostly to Macron. 
But what's most interesting, I think, is Mélenchon. So most of Mélenchon voters are going to abstain, probably in the runoff. But then they split, you know, they split between uh, Macron and Le Pen, which is kind of weird for far left candidate. And uh, the explanation, I think, is is twofold. First of all, you know, is the extremes. You know, they are both like anti-system parties and candidates, and so there is, you know, they, they would vote for whoever is going to 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 overthrow the, the table. And the second reason is is probably this class aspect of, of French politics under Macron that uh, people uh, are, you know, uh, going to vote for the other, you know, party which is largely defined by class, which is which is Le Pen's and. Uh, and, uh, and both are, are actually very anti-capitalist. Of course, the far left is very anti-capitalist and you would believe that it's very difficult for, for them to vote for Macron, uh, who um, you know, is president of the rich, he was an investment banker, et cetera. Um, so this is uh, frightening maybe, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm going to, to, to comment uh, quickly on this and make it uh, as simple as possible. So you have a two axes here. You have a cultural liberalism axis and a economic liberalism, uh, uh, in liberalism in, in the European sense axis. And so you see that the culturally, the two who, who are uh, most uh, uh, you know, conservative, if you want, are Marine Le Pen and Zemmour. Uh, no, especially your know, immigration is their big issues and they are against it. Uh, you see that uh, on the economics, of course, uh, the most uh, you know, uh, anti-capitalist are Mélenchon on the far left and Le Pen on the far right. Um, and then of course, Macron is you know, cultural liberal, liberal and economically liberal, you know, both. And Pécresse has uh, tried to you know, go after the weakness of, of Macron uh, which is which is on you know on this issue of crime and immigration, but uh, but she's uh, you know fairly free market uh, person. Um, so I would like to say a few, a few words about the difference between uh, the two va uh, variations of, of varieties rather of of the of the far right since Zemmour has become a, a candidate. Again, uh, their constituencies are, are different. Marine Le Pen heavily. Uh, and maybe I should not show you more, more slides, but uh, um, Marine Le Pen uh, being heavily, you know, working class uh, basis. Um, and uh, Eric Zemmour, very, very much the same across uh, social economic categories. Uh, so they have very different constituencies. Marine Le Pen also mostly in rural France and uh, Zemmour in, uh, in uh, you know, all categories of, of, you know, all places of residence, including cities. Then there are big differences in, uh, you know, ideology. Uh, you know, Le Pen doesn't believe that uh, uh, she's on the far right because she doesn't believe in the, in the right versus left dichotomy and Zemmour is uh, absolutely on the far right and believes that his nemesis, for example, is Mélenchon. The nemesis of uh, Marine Le Pen is rather Macron because he's kind of the elitist uh, candidate. Uh, different strategies too. Uh, Eric Zemmour wants to uh, uh, bring together the right and the far right. It would be not all the right, but uh, it would be the part of LR, which is the most conservative on issues like immigration and crime. And, and the rest of the, uh, of, of the far right, and uh, which is something that Le, Le Pen doesn't want to do and could not do anyway. So, so the difference, uh, this difference is called by a number of analysts and I, I, took their, I, I took those expressions, populist versus conservative nationalism. It's a little bit like, you know, um, like, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like, uh, Trump, you know, a populist, as Marine Le Pen, if you want, and conservative nationalism is a little bit like the, the National Review, you know. Uh, it's, it's much more intellectual, it's, uh, it's uh, 
it it has uh, you know it, it is it, it is quite different uh, from from uh, independence populism. So um, so I'm going to probably stop here. I mean, just to conclude that uh, so this election, you know, under the appearance of continuity, if like is expected as expected, uh, Macron wins. You know, there's lots going on, uh, especially a big shift to the right and to the far right in French politics. It's not yet, it's, it's not clear yet how, uh, you know, the partisan realignment is going to end up and when. Uh, we see still, you know, the, the parties very splintered, uh, very, uh, very weak. And, um, but with Macron, he won't be able to uh, be a candidate again five years from now. Mélenchon and Le Pen said that they would retire. So lots of change, I think, is the, in the offing for the next, uh, next few years. And uh, I, I, think that, uh, uh, I think that the second Macron uh, you know, term will, will, be, will be probably eventful. <laughs> well, he, he, has, oh yeah, he has no mandate. You know that he's barely, he has barely campaigned. Uh, he's, uh, he has no clear mandates. There's not much in his program except for you know change uh, reform on the on, on pensions, and so uh, so that was what led to you know the 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 revolt of the of the yellow vest uh, uh, three years ago, uh, three and a half years ago, and and that's that's certainly a, that's certainly a weakness. <clears throat> thank you very much. Hey Patrick, thank you very much uh, for deep. Uh, presentation and a detailed uh, overview. Really helpful and thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Arvind Ball in a minute, but I'd, I'd like to ask a first question, uh, if I may. Patrick, you, you touched on Ukraine a couple of times. Could you just say a little bit more broadly uh, about how the Russian war against Ukraine is seen in France? how it's being discussed in media. As you well know, in Germany, it has been jarring for both public and for political establishment. And it's affecting already significantly the debate about many things, including defense spending, all in six weeks. In France, I know it's different, but could you give us a little, a little bit of the feel for the discussion of the war in France? And uh, we'll start there. Sure. As you saw, you know, people are, are worried about it. They are extremely interested about it, and uh, it overwhelms every other issue. Uh, um, and uh, Macron, again, is the president, uh, rotating president of the EU, and uh, has immense visibility on, on, on Ukraine. And of course, as the right kind of the issue, if you want, you know, most people in France are like uh, in, in, in the West are. Uh, of course, are, are very uh, supportive, want to be very supportive of, of Ukraine, are very uh, anti-Putin. Uh, and that's certainly the case, the case in France. So there is a groundswell of, of support for, for Ukraine. Um, I think Macron believes, uh, and not, not just Macron, that uh, it vindicates his view that uh, Europe should, should be more uh, you know, strategically independent, autonomous. Uh, which has been one of the, you know, maybe his major theme uh, uh, on the European, uh, on the European uh, scene uh, in the last uh, five years, and especially now that he's the rotating president of the EU. So I think, and, and, and especially, of course, on, on defense. So I think that it's good news for him that uh, the German are, uh, are, are, have decided to, to, to spend like 100 billion uh, euros on uh, on on defense. Uh, the French have been disappointed, of course, that they are buying uh, American fighter jets instead of French ones. But uh, and and that's uh, but but anyway, I, I think it's all uh, uh, fits very well into the the framework that uh, Macron has of uh, uh, not just of of Europe. And, and should be uh, more, uh, you know, rearm really, and be and, and but rearm uh, both, you know, through NATO and three and through uh, European uh, uh, vehicles, and uh, and also I think you know he's a uh, he's always viewed uh, 
you know French politics as as and his and his um, and his uh, challengers are, are as uh, you know more authoritarian populism etc. And I, and I think that Putin gives you know a kind of a you know a sense of of what uh, he, 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 of the way he paints his, his his opponents in France. I mean there are no Putin like characters, but uh, but I, I think it, it helps him you know in his. Uh, you know, show you know he is very proud uh, of his uh, democratic credential of uh, you know of having stopped Marine Le Pen uh, five years ago in the in the in the runoff and and probably would be very very uh, proud of of beating her again. So Patrick, thank you so much. We're going to open to the gallery. We're going to start with Arvin. In each case, if you would introduce yourself, please. And Patrick or Michelle, it, it's beyond me. If you're able to, could you take down the photograph of the French politician so we can see each other? That may be just on my screen, but there we go. Perfect, perfect. So thank you, Arvin, you have the floor. Really enjoyed the, the presentation a lot. So I, I've written for, for American Purpose on, on how to kind of, uh, you know, uh, set, uh, kind of build the new center-right coalition here in the U.S. And um, wanted to ask you, since immigration and the role of religion are such big issues, how do the sort of the, the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the minority communities tend to vote in France? I think I read that such surveys are prohibited, but I do remember recalling, uh, I think that uh, the, the eighty-six percent of the Muslims voted for Hollande against uh, Sarkozy. So I'm just curious, like where you know. Uh, obviously, they, they've been kind of supportive of the Socialist Party, but the Socialist Party is kind of defunct, and Macron's not necessarily progressive on, you know, on uh, on his on the role of Islam in France, and also the Jewish community, for example. I'm curious how, how they think about the election in the UK. There's been a big shift among sort of uh, the Jewish, Hindu, and Sikh communities, sort of the non-Muslim communities, to the Conservative Party. Uh, and then, secondly, really quickly. How much ideological difference is there between uh, Pakres and Macron? Because it seems to me like Pakres is like I'm two thirds Merkel, one third Thatcher, and even though like even though Macron was originally a socialist, and people say he's a centrist, I mean he seems kind of center right to me economically, um, and even culturally he's very critical of sort of the Ibram Kendi American style left-wing identity politics, which you know, of course much of it originated in France from Foucault. So it, it, like how much difference is there? They seem very similar to me on both these issues of, of, of being against the cultural left and being you know, free market oriented. So, so those are my two questions. Okay, uh, well, let, let me start if you don't mind Keith uh, with your second question. Um, I think the, the the right believes that Macron is on the left, and the left believes he's on the right. Uh, and uh, but he's a little bit on both. You know, this is uh, Macron. You know, he's very difficult to to grasp. You know, because he he has the reputation of uh, of basically uh, you know saying different things to different audiences. You know, and um, I, I think um, clearly he's a liberal economic. Economically, yeah, he's very free market. Uh, he has a, he was a banker. He, he believes in, in in economic reform, which I think are, are his signature reforms. You know, that's what we will remain in his presidency. And 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 France is not doing badly right now in the in the in economics, and and it can be attributed partly to 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 Macron, uh, not not just his his liberal reforms, but also you know the fact that he's is he, he spent a lot of money. Uh, be, you know, as uh, you know, against COVID, on on, on keeping uh, jobs and companies alive, etc. Uh, on, on cultural matters, I think there is still a big difference between uh, between Macron and and the right. Um, and Macron is perceived as uh, as uh, you know, multiculturalist. Uh, he, he criticized the U.S., but 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 he criticized the U.S. maybe in uh, uh, but 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 not not everywhere. I mean, uh, he, he also. Uh, as um, I, I think, um, he, you know, he also supports, you know, like the, the, the idea of, of different communities in France, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, I might come to this actually, as we, as I mentioned, you know, the, what you, you, you brought up uh, about the vote uh, from uh, Jews and, 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 uh, and Muslims. Yes, uh, the Jewish community uh, traditionally in France has been on the left, you know, used to vote about two thirds on the left. 
Uh, this has changed like a couple of decades ago, uh, or started to change a couple of decades ago. So it's mostly now uh, on the right, uh, you know, Macron and the right of Macron. Um, for the Muslim community, it, yes, it's, it's very much on the left. You're right to remind us that uh, it voted 85%, uh, 86% for, for Hollande against Sarkozy, because Sarkozy was tough on immigration, I mean, at least uh, rhetorically. And, uh, and, um, but they didn't support uh, Hollande when, uh, when before he, uh, well, during his presidency actually, and, and, before, he, and before his uh, re-election in which he, he was not a candidate again, because of the of some reforms that uh, the Muslim community opposed, especially uh, gay marriage and this kind of thing. So, so there is, you know, yes, they are on the left, but they are on the left, you know, uh, not the cultural left. Okay. Uh, so, so Macron is very much on the cultural left, and so that I think would be, you know, something that uh, many Muslims would would. You know, would look so. The, so mo most of them are going to vote for Mélenchon anyway. Um, yes, you yeah. wanted to. Yes, yeah, so you're basically saying that so, so they're not going to vote so much for for Macron. It'll be more for Mélen Mélenchon. Yes. And then the Jewish community would it would the vote be between uh, Papres and Macron, or will some of them be attracted to Le Pen or Zemmour as well, or or not at all? Yes, I, I think uh, probably more Zemmour than Le Pen. Not just because Zemmour is Jewish, but because uh, uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, you know he's a conservative against as as opposed to a populist, and he's uh, he's you know he's a very smart, very articulate guy, and um, he, he would he would appeal to uh, to lots of intellectuals, not just Jewish intellectuals. Um, so I, I think yes, uh, and he puts the emphasis on. Uh, on immigration and, and Islam, etc. Marine Le Pen now is, is mostly talking about uh, economics. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think that uh, the Jewish vote. I mean, I don't have data on this, but uh, uh, but I think it would be uh, it would spread itself, you know, between between Macron, Pécresse, and uh, and Zemmour. Yeah. So, so Arvin, oh sorry, forgive me, Patrick. I didn't no. mean to interrupt you. No, okay. I, I just wanted to, to make sure that I answered Keith because which, which, because your question was uh, yes, was yes, kind of absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, so gentlemen, thank you both. I want to go to Keith, and then Ken, Ken, who knows this or that about French politics and keeps an eye on these things. Keith, you have the floor first, please. Thank you very much. Just two points. Uh, the first is that. Uh, as both The Economist and the London Financial Times predict, uh, if Macron does win and it's against Le Pen, it will be much narrower than last time, probably around 53 to 47. What implications do you think that has for the parliamentary elections in June, particularly in view of the fact that Macron's party, En Marche, has never rooted itself strongly among the French electorate? Its support is quite shallow. So that's the first point. The second is really a development today that Macron has called, in view of the atrocities at Boucher, he's called for further energy sanctions, uh, particularly on oil and coal. He's kind of missed out gas for obvious reasons. He doesn't want to offend Chancellor Schultz too much. But what implications does that have for Franco-German relations, particularly in view, of course, that the French get 70% of their energy from nuclear. And uh, the, the developing relationship between Schultz and Macron, it's at very early stages, obviously, because the chancellor is new to the job. Uh, but what implications do you think that has for Franco-German relations? OK, may I start with your second question? Um, I, I think, yes, potentially, of course, it's something that, that could uh, be a little abrasive on, in, in French-German relations uh, uh, because France doesn't need, uh, you know, as you know, as much uh, gas and, and 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 oil from Russia as as Germany. But uh, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, it has, you know, the, the German uh, turnaround on, on nuclear, uh, you know, about uh, ten years ago has been a mm -hmm. big uh, shock for the French, and maybe it's, <laughs> it can be read as a payback. But uh, but uh, I, I'm sure it's it's much more complicated than that. Um, but 
let's say that you know he's basically he's basically yes on the you know uh, taking taking a different path than than the German government with and, and uh, even though so far I think there have been uh, you know it has been a good start between uh, you know the the, the new uh, you know, Olaf Scholz and and and, and Macron. Um, so your other question was it was about the the runoff and 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 Le Pen. Uh, we it was sorry. I can't hear you, Keith. You're on mute. All right. So I'm sorry to have, you know, no. confused the, the names with uh, our earlier questioner, and uh, so this is Keith now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Sorry, Keith. Uh, yeah. Did you get the first point? Yeah. Can, can you remind me me of the, the the key of your question, please? I can't hear you at all. So, so a, a, anyway, the yes, uh, why? Why I think there was some, you know, in your question there was uh, something uh, to the to the extent that um, you know why would Marine Le Pen be so close to Macron? Actually, much closer this time than the last, and uh, and there, there there are answers to that question, which is. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, I think, first of all, uh, uh, there has been growing, uh, there has been discontent with Macron. You know, Macron five years ago he had no record. Uh, so, so that's one question. The second is that the the political uh, public opinion has shifted towards the right. So that's that helps. Uh, that helps uh, uh, Le Pen, especially uh, uh, since uh, most of the uh, first one voters of, of of Zemmour are going to vote for her. Uh, and her party has been more normalized. You know, she has she has made sure that her party was more acceptable. You know, appeals to a broader, a con broader audience. So I think all of these are are, are, are the reasons. Um, sorry, can, can you hear me? sorry, sorry to interrupt you. That wasn't actually my point. Um, my sorry. Point was, my point was that the prediction is a much narrower victory for Macron. What implications does that have? For the legislative parliamentary elections in June, okay, particularly sorry. in particularly in view that En Marche has never established itself uh, in the French electorate, it's not rooted. It's got a very shallow level of support among the electorate in in parliamentary terms. Okay, absolutely. So it will, of course, depend on the margin of victory for for Macron. Um, but uh, I think there are three scenarii uh, for for the legislative elections. One is that uh, you know Macron wins big in the presidential and uh, and keeps not keep actually regains his majority because he doesn't have one right now after uh, so many uh, res resignations in his party. So, but either he has a majority of his own or he uh, has to rely on a part of Les Républicains. Uh, yes, um, so Macron has shifted to the center right from the center left originally, but. Uh, is very close to to uh, uh, with Pécresse, and, and there are talks. You know, there, there is rumors that uh, you know folks around Pécresse, if not Pécresse herself, are going to you know support Macron, and uh, so it would be a, a broadened majority, broadened to part of you know to the as they say Macron compatible LR, and the, and the third would be the third would be of course a cohabitation, and uh, but uh, with LR. It, but that means that LR would win the majority, and nobody can think this. You know that if Pécresse is like under ten percent, or even if she goes just past the fact that she's not in the runoff, I don't think that LR can 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 have a, a majority of its own. All right. So thank you both very much. Can you? We've got you all nine and a half minutes. Can you have the floor? Then we'll go to Noé. And then we'll see where we are. Ken, please, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you, Patrick. It's a phenomenal uh, discussion, extremely enlightening. And uh, you know, I guess a couple of things really strike me uh, listening to your talk. And you and I have discussed these before. Is sort of how much uh, uh, exactly Macron is an elite phenomena and just, you know, how shallow, uh, as the last question noted, his support is really quite striking that it, there really could have been an opposition, an opportunity for the uh, 
they began to come up with uh, a serious candidate and uh, Pécresse uh, tanked, you know, as uh, uh, as we saw early on, though, she led for a while in opinion polls, surprisingly against uh, Macron. Do you, do you think another uh, uh, LR, uh candidate might have uh, had a better showing first? And secondly, what do you make of uh, the claims by some in uh, Zemmour's camp that he's going to actually do a lot better, uh, that there's a hidden vote for him that isn't out there? Uh, Patrick. OK, so on your first question, Ken, uh, I, I think that um, um, Okay, can you remind me the, the first question again? Oh, sure. That uh, Macron is such an elite phenomenon that he yes. has such a support that another candidate besides Pécresse might have been able to box him in. Yes, well, Pécresse, yes, had the, had the fortunate position to have a, a split far right, first of all. So, so you know, she had a big opening uh, there and uh, you know, she, she, she should have probably, I mean, could have at least uh, get ahead of, 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 uh, of, of Le Pen who really had, had Zemmour as a major challenger. Uh, so are there any other candidates? I really don't think so. I really don't think so. Uh, if you think of the other candidates uh, in the primaries, at least, or maybe outside of the primaries, in the primaries, uh, Barnier was a very, very bad candidate. Uh, uh, Bertrand uh, is, you know, was not liked by the base. He's considered too, you know, too much on, on the left of the party. Uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, you have COT who, who, who got forty percent. Yeah, I like COT too. <laughs> uh, who got forty percent of the <laughs> of the of the vote in the primaries against uh, against uh, Pécresse sixty uh, percent. So he did a very good score. But you know, his personality is not like presidential enough, and uh, he's a, he's a he's a very good uh, you know MP, <laughs> but. Uh, but not not uh, presidential material. So so yes, I, I mean outside of of the primaries, then you have uh, Vauquier, for example. But uh, he's kind of uh, he's kind of not very popular within the party. Uh, he's maybe too far right, you know, in the party too. Uh, yes, the someone said that um, you know Pécresse, of course, she describes herself as one third uh, uh, Thatcher, two third uh, two two third uh, Merkel, but in fact. The base of LR is kind of the opposite. <laughs> that means that uh, it's not like Thatcher, but it's kind of uh, it's more right than than Pécresse. And uh, and Pécresse, you know, she has very very little political space uh, because of Macron has has really sucked you know in a lot of of people from uh, from LR, especially because of the economics part and. Uh, and she has uh, no credibility on being tough on immigration and crime. And so people are tempted by, by, by Zemmour on that. Um, so yes, the combination of, of how, how split her party is and how small it is, how, and, and then her own shortcomings, you know, I think that, um, but I don't see that there was a huge, opport you know, a huge opportunity with some, with any other candidate. Yeah, and, and yeah, in part because she's so bourgeois, she's so, I mean, she is so suburban in some she's ways. She's a Versaillaise. The Versaillaise, and she's just not. <laughs> my second question was Zemmour. Is there a hidden Zemmour vote? I mean, I, when I talk to French friends, oh. I'm amazed at how many actually, you know, say they're going to vote for him in the first round. It's a protest mm -hmm. vote. They just can't take Macron. They think he's uh, acting like he's a king. It's, his cabinet is so tightly, you know, it's, it's, there's such control from the Elysee of the government itself. The cabinet doesn't have much of a say. And there's no. a sense that this needs to be opposed, and people are willing. No. I'm wondering if you're seeing more of a hidden vote for Mac, for uh, Zemmour than we're seeing in the polls at all. Um, well, French pollsters have, have been used to to you know uh, uh, measuring the vote of the of the of the far right with Le Pen because the Le Pens have been out there for for thirty or four years, uh, which explains that you know it, you know, the surprise of you know five years ago there was no surprise as so many people said you know it would. It would be uh, Le Pen, uh, it would be uh, it would be Le Pen uh, after Brexit and, and Trump, but it, it didn't turn out like this. I, I think that Zemmour, yes, is, is a new thing, of course, for posters. I mean, uh, um, and there might be uh, something uh, like uh, maybe a one or two percent difference, but it it won't it won't change the the, the deal, unfortunately, uh, for for Zemmour. 
Uh, no, the, what's going to happen is after, after the election. This is when we are going to see whether <clears throat> Le Pen retires, uh, her successor Bardella is not very good, you know, uh, is young, but not very good. Um, you know, if Zemmour is going to continue to try to merge the, the conservative LR like, uh, like, uh, like Ciotti with the far right and to uh, reshape the far right. Uh, of course, um, Marion Le Pen, <clears throat> who is the niece of Marine Le Pen, but who sided with Zemmour against her aunt. You know, Marine, Marion Le Pen is a very gifted politician. And, uh, and she, she, I think she, if she wants to uh, get back into politics, she's left politics for in the last few years. I think she, she has, a, there, there is a big, um, you know, you know there, there is some, uh, some, you know, she, she has some, uh, some hope, yeah. So Ken, thank you for that. And Patrick, thank so, you, Ken. so you all, here's where we are. We have three minutes to go. Right. I can cut it off here or I can offer the floor to Noe and you too, Patrick, have to do it in three minutes. You wanna give it a try? Yes, let's give it a try. Noe, you have the floor and Matilda, thank you for your question and chat and we'll hear from you next time in person, so to speak. Noe, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I'll keep this short and brief. Um, my question really is what happened to the PS after they collapsed? The uh, political milieu, the grassroots, their activists, political infrastructure, have they all just gone over to Macron or has something else occurred? That, that's a big question, uh, an interesting one. I think that most of them, yes, have, have joined Macron and some of course have joined Mélenchon. It's exactly what happened at LR, you know? So these parties that have collapsed five years ago, not only are they smaller, but they are completely they are split down the middle. And um, so I don't have a great, uh, great hope for the PS. Um, I don't see how, how actually, uh, you know, the, the, the left can, can uh, reorganize, uh, you know, uh, probably around uh, the Greens will, will probably remain, you know, the Greens. Uh, uh, then um, you have the far left with Mélenchon, but yes, the, the, the moderate left of the, of the PS type, I, I don't know uh, if, if there is enough there to, 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 um, to, to have a party. On, on the right, it's, it's, it's more clear you know, what could happen. I think that uh, because Macron's party is, has moved to the center right from the center left, it will become probably the center right party. You know, it, it, under somebody like his, his first prime minister, Edouard Philippe, it will be the center right party. And then you'll have you know, of course, we don't know what's going to happen the far right, but but there will be, uh, of course, uh, one or two parties on the far right. So, so I think yes, the most difficult uh, thing to predict is is the moderate left. So you all, amazing, twelve fifty nine Eastern and thirty seconds. Thank you for helping me keep you all on time. No way, that was a great question. Uh, to conclude with, Patrick, uh, what, what a wonderful hour spent to hear from you and to profit from that presentation you prepared. Really, really first rate. So to all of you for making time, your time is precious, and for a terrific briefing and conversation. Thanks. Patrick Chumrell, thanks very much. Tip of hat. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone.